Thank you for having me. I'm Robert Rivas. I live in Tallahassee, Florida with my wife, Julia Hanway, who's here. Um, we're both involved with an organization called Final Exit Network. Um, it's sort of based in Tallahassee. There's an address in Tallahassee. Uh, that's just because we happen to be there and that's where we answer the mail. But it's a, it's a nationwide organization primarily driven by uh, volunteers, most of whom are senior citizens, and um, they are at the leading edge of the movement for the right to death with dignity. Um, one of the most important national organizations in the movement is the Death with Dignity National Center, which is what Lisa is affiliated with. And their focus, uh, we have tremendous respect for. There's, not, this is, there's no competition at all. They're just doing a different, performing a different function in our society. They spend all of their time, as they have since the, since the 1990s, when they were instrumental in getting the original Oregon law uh, passed in a public initiative. Um, they stay focused on providing political support for law change. And that's what they do. Final Exit Network spun out of an organization, you may remember the name, called the Hemlock Society. It dates back to the 1990s. Um, the old timers of the Hemlock Society, when it broke up, formed around Final Exit Network and really became the, the driving force behind Final Exit Network. These volunteers um, make plans to, uh, are organized so that you contact Final Exit Network, www.finalexitnetwork.org. If you go to www.finalexit, it will take you to the website called the ERGO, the Euth Euthanasia Research and Guidance Organization, which is run by Derek Humphrey. He's the great gray eminence of the right to die movement. He wrote a book called Final Exit in the 1990s that uh, our organization is, it's our, uh, we're its namesake. Or is that the other way around? The, the uh, uh, Final Exit is the namesake of the Final Exit Network. And Final Exit Network, www.finalexitnetwork.org. Um, if you go there, you'll find out everything you, you might want to ask about it. There's also Most members of Final Exit Network, a lot of people think that they would never call Final Exit Network until they're ready to die, and that's the reason you call. We just wish we could get people over that idea. 90%, 95% of the members of Final Exit Network are not dying. They're not contemplating their deaths at this time at all. They're members because they want to show support for Final Exit Network and because they want to give contributions, uh, even if it's just in the annu small annual membership fee. I think it's $50 for an individual and $75 for a couple. Even that will be marked down if you can't afford it. Um, but they want to show support for the right to the, move the movement for the right to death with dignity, and they want to show support for what exit guides do. We also have two uh, copies of the quarterly newsletter over there, recent ones. One of them's got a, an article on uh, people dying with Alzheimer's, and uh, it was mentioned earlier this evening, talking with your kids about your end of life choices. Um, there's an article on how to talk to your, your grown up children about your desires and preferences because it's important for them to know. But back to Final Exit Network, the, these volunteers called Exit Guides we get a call, it's not a pro-suicide organization, there are people who have thought that, and it's a weird notion. I think of suicide as being something that is a tragedy that somebody who dr is driven to when they shouldn't be because of a condition um, of the mind that, that makes, them, makes them seek out suicide, and that's what suicide is, but our culture doesn't have a word to distinguish Suicide, and I mean, by that I mean one that is driven by an irrational impulse, from one terminating one's own suffering when there's no alternative. There's no alternative except a miserable, brief remaining experience. Maybe it would even be a long time. But there's no way to alleviate the suffering. There's no way to end whatever is making your life miserable. Um, in that case, and, and, and we screen to make sure that we only have appropriate people who are legitimately candidates for Final Exit Network's Exit Guide Services. 
And once we screen, we work with them to provide exit guides to go teach them how to make sure that they don't botch their own deaths. We don't have a word for that kind of, to, that kind of death, and I accept the use of the word suicide sometimes because as a lawyer, that's what it is legally. It's, to me, it's just a legal term, and I, have, and I sort of have to use it a lot. Um, I, by the way, have been litigating um, matters pertaining to constitutional cases pertaining to the right to death with dignity in, uh, in trial courts and appellate courts across the country since well, just about exactly 20 years now, since the 1996. Um, I've had decisions of the Supreme Courts of Florida, Georgia, and, uh, and Minnesota that were a result of, of uh, my work that uh, expanded or affirmed the right to death with dignity. Well, in Florida we lost, but it nonetheless was an important landmark case in the 1990s for even for having lost. But um, exit guides go to people who have applied and have been cleared by our committee of medical professionals to uh, obtain services that basically amount to nothing more than giving information and showing compassion and showing support. The other groups, in, uh, like the Death with Dignity National Center, involved in the, right to the mo for in the movement for the right to death with dignity, don't really get involved in that kind of direct support. They stay focused on lobbying legislatures and passing ballot initiatives and things. Final Exit Network takes the position that when the laws are all changed across the country so that they're all perfect, then there will be no more need for Final Exit Network, and we'll be very happy. We'll be happy to shut to uh, sh shut the doors and and uh, discontinue e even existing. But um, until then, somebody needs help now. And that includes not only all of the people who live in states where there's no death with dignity law, and there are death with dignity laws in only four states, but um, even in the, law, in the states that have death with dignity laws, physician-assisted suicide laws, those laws don't apply. It's been discussed by a couple of people who raised some questions here tonight. This problem just keeps uh, nagging at the, at the issue is that they don't, they, don't, they don't have the flexibility to allow somebody who um, has a long, slow process ahead of them where a doctor could never say, you have from today and they have to say within a quote unquote reasonable degree of medical probability, you have six months or less to live. The doctors can't say that. I mean, the whole idea is absurd. The law is, is working with a fiction. They're trying to get the public to accept the idea that the law is only applicable to people who are terminally ill and dying. But the fact is, even with an ord most ordinary cancer patients, depending, you know, depending on the patient, the type of cancer and so forth, but most ordinary patients, when a doctor signs one of those six-month statements, you know, the person's within six months of death, they don't really know that. Doctors will all tell you. They don't know that. When a, when a patient enters, all the nurses here can tell you, when a patient enters the final agonal stage, as it's called, the dying stage, that's obvious. Then if they waited until then, the doctor could say, well, sure, right, six months less, absolutely, it's perfectly clear. But somebody who's, who's not yet reached that stage which is everybody who is applying for the application of a death with dignity law, somebody who has not yet reached that stage, any doctor would have to say, I don't know, he might uh, hit upon a hot streak. You know, it could very well be that, he, that this person, this patient, she uh, carries on for nine months. I, I can't say within a reasonable, or a year. It would not be a miracle from God, it would be a phenomenon of nature if the person happened to live two years. Who knows? That's what the doctors really will tell you. They tell you that it's phony as hell to sign a six-month certification. So they, what they do, I believe what doctors do, is they, they ask themselves, is it reasonably clear to me that this person's terminally ill, is going to die soon, and I think that this person's a logically a sound candidate, and if so, I'll go ahead and sign the six-month thing. That's really what it amounts to. But nonetheless, they won't sign it for somebody who's got who's clearly got two years left to live, and Final Exit Network will talk to those people and help them. We don't help them, I, excuse me, I, I shouldn't say that. 
one of the things that we have to do in Final Exit Network in order to keep the organization alive in the world is not violate the law against assisting in a suicide. There are laws in 39 states that make it a felony to assist in a suicide. It's the only law in American culture that's known to the Western world where it's a crime to assist somebody in doing something that itself is not a crime. It's not a crime to commit suicide, but it's a crime to assist somebody else in suicide. What does assisting mean? It's a problem that causes the litigation that I mentioned that I've been doing all over the country. Uh, we think that under the First Amendment, there is an absolute First Amendment protected right to go to people and give them information to go to people and show them emotional support. Tell them they're not crazy. Tell them that there are people out there who understand what they're going through, and it will, it will even sit with you when you do it. Won't touch anything. Can't even lift up a, something that you need in the dying process and hand it to you, because that's assistance. Assistance to us, we think the law should require. I'm, I'm succeeding so far, bit by bit, in establishing across the country that the law should be that Assisting means somebody has to do something physically. It can be done one of two ways. You can assist either by providing the means, so if you give somebody, the, the gun, you give a heartbroken teenager a gun, and you leave, and you're not there the next day when he uses it or hours later when he uses it, that's providing the means. By providing the means, be it drugs or whatever, you, that's assisting in a suicide. So providing the means or physical assistance. Physical assistance means doing something at the scene of the death that the person wasn't able to do with their own hands. Or maybe they would have been, but if you did it with your own hands, then you assisted. So um, Final Exit Network's protocols prohibit that. We don't do that. We don't assist in suicides. But we think that we cannot be convicted. We should never be charged and cannot be convicted in this country of a crime for exercising the First Amendment protected right to give information to people about how they can lawfully succeed in terminating their own suffering and to give information to them about how they can avoid making the mistakes that people frequently make. So we go to bedsides, we do that. We do that in Oregon, Washington, California, and Vermont, the states where they have death with dignity laws because we sometimes do it for people who are dying. We refer to what we call, uh, Lisa spent some time talking about this, the, we refer to what we call the window of opportunity. The window of opportunity is between the time when you know you need to terminate, you're going to need to terminate your suffering. You need to start making plans for that. And the time when you cross a threshold where you're either not competent or you don't have the physical ability to accomplish your death on your own by yourself so nobody else has to do it. And we can all whisper and never again mention the truth to each other, but I'm happy to report that occasionally relatives do assist people in the privacy of their homes and nobody ever knows about it, and, but that's, that's, that's just between them, people that need to know how to be discreet if they're going to do something like that. Um, and Final Exit Network doesn't do it. We're not winking and, and then really providing assistance. We don't do that. We just don't provide assistance. But so Final Exit Network now is uh, active publicly in promoting the idea that death with dignity laws should be enacted across the country that don't have the six-month provision, the provision that says the patient has to be within six months of dying, or six months of death so as to include people with Alzheimer's disease, people who are uh, dying from ALS, and other people refer to ALS occasionally who, they're not even referring to uh, ALS necessarily. It's, it's become a catch-all term for a number of different diseases that gradually dissolve your, your uh, central nervous system. But and Lowy's syndrome is one of those. Um, but all those kinds of diseases uh, that 
you know you're passing from a stage where you can now use your own hands and drink a potion that contains second all that was prescribed for you. But if you don't get it and take it now, you're soon going to lose the use of your hands or your ability to swallow. And then they're going to put you on a gastro Komosiyama t- tube in your stomach, a feeding tube. And uh, uh, it's too late for you to get a way to die. I think what ultimately has to happen is laws need to be changed uh, much more severely than they're being changed now with the death with dignity laws. There has to be, uh, we have to arrive at a state where um, a person can, a competent person can be put through the tests, whatever is necessary, to sign a document that gives legal authorization and requirement, legal authorization at the very least, for somebody to use, an intra, somebody else to apply, an intravenous uh, uh, means of causing the death. That's crossing a line that in, in medicine is referred to as the difference between euthanasia and assisting in a suicide. Assisting in a suicide, the person who wants to die, who needs to die, is the one who actually causes it in the last, in the la- as far as the last step is concerned. Remember Dr. Kevorkian's machines? He made those machines. I mean, it was equivalent of homicide by any moral standards or euthanasia by any standards of you know, good sense. But legally, technically, it was assisted suicide because he set up those machines so that uh, the person had to pull down a switch, press a button, do something. The last last little movement of the finger was the thing that made the difference between whether he was committing homicide or euthanasia. Euthanasia, a separate person causing one's death, is 100% of the time murder in the United States. There's no such thing, there's no state that authorizes any form of euthanasia. And um, I think it's a shame, but it's going to be a very, very long time. I think what has to happen before we move to the next few stages, one stage being eliminating the six months provision, that's not, that could come soon, in our lifetimes. The second stage being the prior authorization for euthanasia at a specified time when somebody says, at a, if it comes to the point where, and you can list the circumstances beyond which that person doesn't want to live any longer, and I ask that, I direct that I then be, uh, my life then be terminated as, by, in, by euthanasia. Um, that's at least a generation away. It's, it's a long, it's, it's going to be a long time, and I believe that it's going to take a period of time when people get accustomed to the physician aid and dying laws for them to then be ready to make the next step toward euthanasia laws. By the way, you hear references to physician-assisted suicide. You know where that terminology came from? In 1994, a campaign was initiated in Oregon for a a voter initiative petition to create this physician aid and dying law. They called it PAD. PAD can stand for physician aid and dying or physician-assisted death. Same thing, but the opponents heard that, ter- heard that phrase and turned it a little bit and said, let's call it physician-assisted suicide because that'll make people reflexively not like it. The object of that terminology is just to make people not like the idea. It sounds like an oxymoron. Uh, physician assisting a suicide? What are you kidding? I mean, like, physicians don't do that. Many people in the movement are struggling to get everybody to stop using the word suicide. Personally, I just think that suicide is, you know, the freighting of the term with all of this religious stuff about how God prohibits it and you're going to go burn in hell forever if you initiate your own death. All that stuff is, is going to fade from the language, I think, and, and suicide will be an acceptable word sooner or later. But um, in the meantime, the effect that it has on the debate nationally is that people in the movement who are behind law change 
really want to get everybody like Final Exit Network and uh, anybody out there who says anything about eliminating the six-month provision or, or moving in the direction someday of having euthanasia to shut up because the opponents get up and say, oh, there's a slippery slope. I mean, you know, they guess the slippery slope thing. I'm so tired of hearing about the slippery slope. I mean, I, I, it, it, it sounds so flip that it just feeds the opponents for them to hear me say this, but I mean, I, yeah, we're on a slippery slope. We need to slip down it a little more, and we as a culture and as a society need to decide when we're going to stop sliding down the slope. It was only 20 years ago that it was legally, that, that a hospital in, in West Palm Beach, Florida, brought a lawsuit against the state attorney saying that it would be a crime to, to uh, there's a guy named Abe Perlmutter, and he kept pulling out the, the, this tracheal tube, the, the a breathing tube, and um, every time nobody was looking, he'd pull it out. He'd force it back down and he'd pull it out, and they'd force it back down. The hospital filed a petition in court thinking that it was a crime for them not to put it back in him. Well, I think it was a crime. I think it was battery, a simple battery for them to put it back in him against his, you know, over his objection. He was competent. But it's only been a generation ago that it was thought that it was required by law. This is the reason we have an aid and dying movement, is because medicines become so separated from individuals that in the post-war era, as medicine got better and better, dying got worse and worse because everybody forgot that uh, the object of medicine is to make people better. And that doesn't necessarily mean requiring them to die hooked up to tubes in a hospital. And so by the 80s and 90s, that thing of being dying in a hospital hooked up to tubes had just reached proportions that were staggering. It was terrifying, the thought of confronting a death because of the fact that you knew you were going to go through this, this excessive hospitalization thing and you'd be and you'd, you'd suffer to death. The, half the American people in those days died of ICU psychosis uh, because that's what happens when you're 24-7 surrounded by hospital lights in an ICU. But um, the, the, um, the entire medical profession has been profoundly influenced by the movement for physician aid in dying and final exit networks work because until the 1990s, there had never been a serious component in medical teaching for doctors about death. Doctors didn't want to talk about death. They didn't want to talk about what to do about it. And and it, it's, there's a specific backlash reaction in the medical community, the fact that so many people in the public are clamoring for assistance in death, and so many doctors, and it used to be that all doctors just automatically recoiled from it, so I can't do that, self-righteously pretend as if it's a uh, doctor you do no harm. It's violating the Hippocratic Oath. You're harming somebody. You're causing their death. Well, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of looking at it differently to realize that if the doctor's not there for the person when they're dying, then the doctor's failing in the doctor's duties to the patient. And the number of doctors who recognize that is growing, and it's because the movement has provoked medical schools, the medical establishment, the medical community, all to start changing their thinking and do more. Hospice has been behind a lot of it, too. Uh, hospice is a great organization, and there's nothing we do and nothing that is ever done under any death with dignity law that is inconsistent with good hospice care. Good hospice care should be perfectly happy to come along and say, well, the person wants aid in dying, physician aid in dying, and has the pills next to his bed. That's great. We'll take care of them until the day they die. What's inconsistent? Nothing. But some hospices like to sort of proclaim their opposition to aid in dying and will simply walk away and abandon a patient who says, I intend to try to seek out uh, aid in my, in my death. Um, it seems inconsistent with what they claim to support. But those are my thoughts. Um, two cents, please. Anybody? Yes, I understand that my whole life is just a blink of an eye. The history of the earth is really
Thank you so much.